And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Bunny! Yes. Bunny, 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 bunny! Bunny! Bunny, 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 bunny! Bunny! I just took an edible. So that's fun. I have a license and I take them legally. I want to talk about the watch I'm wearing. This is this watch. It was your it was your it was your father's watch. I stuck it up my ass. So um I I I got it at a thrift store and it works, but I don't want it to. What I do is I wear this watch whenever I've taken an edible. So I, what I do is I set the time to whenever the last time was I took an edible. So like an hour and a half from now when I start feeling it, I'm like, oh, man, when did I take that? 405. Gotcha. And also I've let my uh, wife know that if I seem out of it, feel free to just grab my wrist and look. And it'll be right there. <laughs> it's really nice. Once my son, Mal, was sitting here at my spot and going through my stuff and saw the watch and started winding it. And they made it work. And I got so upset. Oh. So I, I, I set the watch to like, okay, this is when I took the edible. So then I'm out and about. And it's like, oh. Starting to feel it. When did I take the edible? Wait, isn't that now? Damn it, my watch started working. Who fixed my watch? I am very upset that my watch is working. I bought this watch so it would not work. This is only here to help me with being high. So anyway, <laughs> Glenn or Glenn... <laughs> I'm so excited about this episode. This has been such a fun episode. I like talking about the Razzies in the first part. And in the second part, talking about the presidents. That was so much fun. Yes. This has already been a fun episode. And now we've finally gotten to the actual movie. And this this is this is going to be so great. So, yes. It's time, buddy. It's time. It's time. Yes, Bunny, my friend who is more than brother to me, I embrace thee. Because it is time once again, that line, my friend who is more than brother to me, I embrace thee, is a reference to a cartoon from the 60s. Uh, I posted the video on our Facebook group, the Pope on Film Facebook group. We post a bunch of memes. It's the best. You should join it. Um, I got to mention that Tom, that cartoon earlier today, earlier this week, someone on Twitter said it, it was talking about how white people love taking black slang, slang words, which is ridiculous because white people have so many like stupid, dumb phrases that only white people use. And so I said in the 60s, there was a cartoon where uh, a train operator saw a superhero throw a tree and the train operator said for the love of mike look at that and i was in i was really happy to, to to do two references from the same forgotten 1960s thor cartoon yes for the love of mike look at that that's that's white slang yes you know what else i would call white slang live laugh love Oh, yeah. That's also white slang. Oh, here's another bit of white slang. Keep calm and carry on. <laughs> That's another one. So, yes, buddy, my friend, who is more than brother to me, I embrace thee. Because it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film podcast to hey, Macarena, our way into the third and final part of our big shoe. And it is said third part wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our all new digitally remastered and stunning 4K and for a limited time buy one and then you have one. 
Then you have one. Good yes. for you. You have one of them. Because it's time for our movie of the week! And this week we take a second gender-heavy look at director Ed Wood's magnum opus, which is right here! So cool! Glenn or Glenda! Subtitle Part 2. Sub Subtitle The Return. Sub Sub Subtitle Again. <laughs> Dumb Title which is stronger than a subtitle. There's sub, there's titles, and then there's subtitles down here, and then up here are dom titles. Um, this time it's personal. Subtitle, The Squeakwall. So, Ed Wood's highly personal 1953 drama, Glenn or Glenda, we actually covered this episode once before, which means, that Edwards, Glenn or Glenda, is now in a very exclusive club. Yes. Movies the Pope on film have covered more than once. Okay, so there's the laughable 1957 flick, The Giant Claw. Yes. It was the first movie we ever did, and so for like episode 100 or episode 200, we, we did it again. <clears throat> because back then when we first started the podcast, like every episode was like 20 minutes or something like that. And then eventually it ballooned into like, like when we did the movie Wally, and I decided to have my wife do it, and she took, I believe it was eighty-seven pages of notes. Yeah, that episode was about uh, three days long, and now we've gone back down to like a good tight two hours, but this one might be a little bit longer. Um, so there's the giant claw. Then there's cats, and we did two back-to-back -back episodes for that movie because that movie deserved it. <laughs> and I see Taylor Swift and she's conquering the world and she's doing tours sold out tours and she's super successful and all these people love her and they're 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 uh, Swifties and they love Taylor Swift and and every time I see Taylor Swift I laugh because she went to cat school yes somewhere someone has seen Taylor Swift on all fours pretending to be a cat sniffing Judy Dench's asshole. Yes. I don't know how you do that and still be a huge celebrity. How do you do <laughs> that? I want to learn your secrets, Taylor Swift. So, Giant Claw, cats, and technically... I don't know if this one counts, but Night of the Living Dead, we did four different versions of it. Yes. We did Night of the Living Dead. We did Rift Tracks Night of the Living Dead. We did Night of the Living Dead Remastered. And then we did that remake where the girl uh, is a badass. Yes. I like that one. I actually like that one. I remember the, the, the remastered, the, the, the animated one wasn't that great but that was a fun episode it brought everyone together and of course it goes without saying every christmas we do the same movie yes santa and the ice cream bunny for uh, for uh, <coughs> uh da, 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 da. every christmas we do the 1972 kitty film santa and the ice cream bunny starring the titular ice cream bunny Either Thumbelina or Jack and the Beanstalk, and Agent Crashmore himself, AOL Blast's favorite actor, Santa Claus, who, it should be noted, rates a 9.5 on the Joe Don Baker sweat meter. Yes. Woo! Mean! Woo! Gene! Okay, so here's what we do every Christmas. I... I would never say this during Christmas, but uh, it's my birthday episode. I feel comfortable saying it now. I'll probably never say it again. So here's the thing. Um, we've been doing Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny for seven years now. And so I wrote notes. The first time, 
that, that we did it. Episode 105, I wrote these notes on paper for Santa and the ice cream bunny. And then I thought, hey, it's Christmas. Like the next year when we decided to do Santa and the ice cream bunny again, I just thought, I'm just going to read the same notes. <laughs> it's not like anyone's going to get angry. Hardly anyone listens or cares. I'm going to use the same notes. So then like the third time we did it, I said, this year we're once again for the third year in a row doing Santa Claus and the ice cream bunny. But uh, this time I have all new notes, entirely new. And then I read the same notes. And so I would always say a brand new fresh take on Santa and the ice cream bunny. But I would just get these old notes from like, seven years ago and just read them over and over again uh then in 2002 was just a rough year for me so i lost two-thirds of the notes so this past christmas what i did was i got the page of notes that i've had for seven years and then i transcribed the rest okay from soundcloud but what I did was I added a few new jokes, which I will now be repeating every year. So that's what we do every Christmas. And I freaking love it. I love the Joe Don Baker sweat meter joke that I get to say every Christmas. <coughs> I love it. It's just this little thing that Bunny and I do that nobody else pays attention about or gives a crap about, but I love it so much. Oh, special place in my heart. <laughs> Anywho, episode 199, the first time that we did Glenn or Glenda, uh, it was a New Year's episode. I wrote a really killer opening for this episode, and... Uh, I found the notes, and Bunny, if I may, I'd like to read to you the opening of episode 199, if I may. Certainly. Okay. Bunny! Yes? I hope you had a good New Year's Eve. My family and I sure did. You know, we didn't go to some party. We didn't paint the town like... Some people do. No, we had a nice time at home as a family. It was a typical sort of New Year's Eve for us. Nothing special, nothing hoity-toity. It was a very much just a standard uh, mail-in New Year's Eve. We stayed up. We drank a little bit. We Then we ran out of champagne, so we switched to wine. And when that was gone, we started drinking mezcal. When the mezcal was done, we started drinking absinthe. And the next thing you know, you're in an alleyway in Marfa, Texas, trying to sell your daughter's teeth for a 12-count package of white, fresh mint-flavored Tic Tacs that a demon told you would unlock the shadow dimension if you just get the Tic Tacs and shove them up actress Joyce DeWitt's puckered asshole. So very much a typical New Year's <laughs> Eve for my family. Yes. You know, uh, and hey, pro tip for you listeners out there, do not leave Marfa, Texas without visiting the Late Night Museum of Electronic Wonders and Grilled Cheese located at 909 West San Antonio Street. But be warned, they're only opened after 9.30 p.m. It's kind of an odd museum slash grilled cheese eatery. <laughs> and I was a bit confused about that, so I looked it up. That was real. <laughs> The Late Night Museum of Electronic Wonders and Grilled Cheese did exist at 909 West San Antonio Street in Marfa, Texas. They changed. They later changed, after this episode, they changed their name to the Food Shark Late Night Museum of Electronic Wonders and Grilled Cheese, and they didn't open at 9.30 p.m. They opened from 6.30 to 2.30, but they were only open on, like, Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays, like a really strange schedule. But yeah. it was like a bizarre art museum, kind of like a pre-Meow Wolf sort of uh, interactive art museum that sold nothing but grilled cheese sandwiches. Uh, they have since closed, a few years ago, the Food Shark Late Night Museum of Electronic Wonders and Grilled Cheese did close down. So, hey, Marfa, Texas, good place to sell your kids' teeth. 
but a bad place to get grilled cheese. Yes. I cannot stress that enough. Funny. Let me tell you about this episode of the Pope on Film. I was trying to think of what I wanted this episode to be because uh, it was just my birthday. And usually in March, I just fill it with a bunch of movies that that I like and that I want to watch. But this year, this year, I'm trying to do different movies, weirder movies, stranger movies. In the next episode, we're doing Skinamarink. I can't wait for you to watch it and tell me everything you think about it. Okay. Because I think that, like, if Amber, my 21-year-old, she doesn't watch a lot of horror movies. She watches a lot of Netflix. If she sat down and watched Skinamarink, it might scare the life out of her. But if, if, like, Day and Christian saw it, I think they would hate it to death. So I'm interested to see where you think. I think it's a very interesting movie, and I can see how people are scared of it, but also, it sucks. <laughs> so I'm really interested. Like, there are some people out there. You search hashtag Skinamarink on Twitter, and there are some people out there. I am scared to death. I am haunted by this. I'm having a hard time sleeping. People are scared shitless about this movie. And then other people are like, what the hell did I just see? It's not even a movie. <laughs> it's not a movie. It's a bizarre YouTube video that's been stretched out. It's like someone got Bob's dirty shorts but didn't show Bob and made it black and white in an hour and 45 minutes. Yeah. It is so weird, and I can't wait to tell you about it. But I, to, to talk to you about it, but I was trying to think of what I wanted the Glenn or Glenda episode to be, and that's when I realized what this episode is. This is a podcast episode of stark realism, taking no sides, but giving you the facts. Pause for dramatic effect. All the facts as they are today. You are society. <laughs> Judge ye not. So, buddy, this is truly an honor. I hope you realize how how much of an honor this is. Uh, why don't you give us the plot of Edwards Glenn or Glenda? Glenn or Glenda is a well, what level do we want to be on? It is a struggle yeah. of a man about to get married and needs to tell his girlfriend about his cross-dressing. Mm -hmm. Then there's a lot of interesting filler. And that's, that's it. What else is going on here? My wife knew about my cross-dressing very early into our relationship. I remember wearing women's clothes um, secretly at your parents' house. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I remember that. I remember one time... I, I didn't remember this until Lauren reminded me that one time you and I went to church in California. Oh, we did? And I was wearing a thong ah! of yours and I apparently forgot about it. And we're sitting there praying, and, you know, it's Sacramento, so we're praying in basically like a warehouse that has been turned into a church in the industrial side of town where all the Koreans went to church. Oh, oh their food was so good. I'm like, I will sit here for what might be a two-hour Easter sermon if it means that afterwards I can go to the uh, luncheon that they're having for free, because that Korean food, ah, ah. Like there's no chance my cook is going uh -huh. to, but I miss you. That was so good. So, so our they, we weren't sitting in pews at this uh, Korean church. We were sitting in uh, folding chairs 
And so I didn't realize that my uh, uh, in-laws sitting behind me were seeing my whale tail. Okay. Because they could 100% just see my thong right there. And it's like, dang, what other church people saw my thong? So it's it's been a it's been a a long uh, road for me, but okay. So before we get into me, here's a bit of history taken from the Holy Gospel according to Rudolph Gray. Glory be to thee, O Wood. This is Nightmare on of Ecstasy, the Life and Art of Ed Wood D. Wood Jr. The movie Ed Wood was loosely based on this. I say loosely based because originally Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, the screenwriters of the 1994 film Ed Wood, wanted to make a movie specifically about Ed Wood. But when they heard that Tim Burton was interested, they said, okay, how do I don't think that Tim Burton will want to make this movie. So we need to change the script to make it focus on something that would make. Tim Burton want to make the film. Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski knew that um, Ed Wood was friends with Vincent Price before he died. So they rewrote the script for Ed Wood to be about Ed and his relationship with Bella. Yeah. And uh, a lot of that isn't 100% real. There are some liberties taken, but um, this is really what you need to know when it comes to Ed Wood. So, uh, indie movie producer George Weiss wanted to make a bio picture of the life of Christine Jorgensen, uh, the first major name to ever have a sex change of male to female. Yes. And they went to wannabe filmmaker Ed Wood. He immediately said, what if we get Bella Lugosi to be in this film? And George Weiss wasn't sure about that because he made black and white indie grindhouse type films. Thank you for the backup dancing, Maxwell. <laughs> Maxwell, my 11-year-old, doing the backup dancing. Thank you for that. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Are you saying I'm not entertaining? Only the infinity of the depths of a man's mind can really tell the story. In case, in case they don't want to hear about the movie and they just want to look around. Rude. Rude. But but you keep dancing. You keep dancing. So uh, uh, George Weiss wasn't used to having names in his movies, but uh, George Weiss offered Bella Lugosi just 500 bucks. Yeah. To be in Glen or Glenda. Bella said no because he refused to be in indie movies. Yeah. I'm I. I, I'm not going to be in just some cheap indie movie. I'm a star. I go to, I make studio movies. Thank you. This name right here saved Universal. All right. So. Yep. Okay. Then. So he refused to do the movies. Ooh, he was a big star. But then two things happened. Number one, they couldn't get the rights to the Christine Jorgensen story. In the movie, Ed Wood, they said, Goddamn Variety had to print the story before I got the rights. Now that bitch is asking for the sky. Number one, good on you, George Weiss, for using Christine Jorgensen's correct pronouns. Yeah. But um, that is not the truth. Christine's parents were very much still alive. Uh-huh. And as long as they were still alive, Christine Jorgensen refused to do any movies, any TV appearances, any lecture tours, nothing. So now Ed couldn't directly use her story. So he used more of his story. And then number two, Bela Lugosi was married at the time, despite what um, the movie Ed Wood says. Bela Lugosi was married at the time. Lillian Lugosi, she grabbed, dragged Bella by the ear over to Ed's apartment. Knock, knock, knock on the door. It's Bella and Lillian, open up. And I don't want to say they had their tails between their legs, but Lillian was basically all, Bella did not want to do your picture. 
but we're broke. So if you could double what he was originally offered, then we'll consider it. So uh, they gave him a thousand and made this character of basically God. Which I love. Uh, but that was what angered George Weiss. He did low budget, early black and white grindhouse movies about sex and drugs and violence. But um, here's the thing. If you make it clinical and pretend that it's educational, then you can get away with whatever crap you want. Like uh, those uh, pre-code movies. Like Maniac and Sex Fiend and uh, I just realized I've been talking to a lamp. Okay, that shot is Skinamarink. <laughs> that shot of a lamp, that's like 15 minutes of Skinamarink. That is hilarious. Just imagine that, but grainier, and that's the movie Skinamarink. I can't wait to do it. <laughs> So George Weiss wanted I changed my sex to be clinical to, as they would say back then, and remember this because it'll come in later, take the curse off it. So if it's an educational film, you can you can film whatever crap you want. A lady nude jumping in the pool, someone getting stabbed, everyone doing drugs. Oh, it's okay. We're teaching the youth. Yeah. So Ed got what was originally going to be this clinical educational film. Um and made it into what was essentially a biopic with Bela Lugosi as God. I mean, I don't hate George Weiss for adding the BDSM scenes in the middle of all this. Like, I get it. I understand where George Weiss is coming from. This film is too tame to be dirty and too controversial to be tame. Yeah. So George Weiss just tipped the scales with a bit of BDSM in the middle of the movie so people didn't walk out. I get it. You know? So Ed Wood made this movie, Glenn or Glenda, also known as I Led Two Lives, Behind Locked Doors, He or She, I Changed My Sex, and finally, Glenn or Glenda, The Way of Water. To be honest, yes. you probably won't believe me when I say this, I did make one of those titles up, but I'm not telling you which one. You'll have to figure that out for yourself, kid. Okay, so let's uh, put a pin on that and uh, talk about a subject that I know very well, me. Uh, I have known about Ed Wood since the third grade, thanks to a wonderful movie called It Came From Hollywood. Yes. Greatest cast in the frickin' world. Uh, Gilda Radner, John Candy... Dan Aykroyd, Cheech and frickin' Chong, all in one movie? That is crazy. The fact that more people aren't absolutely obsessed. Ten minute with warning. It came from Hollywood. Blows me away. Ten minute warning. So, uh, it's uh, just a collection of uh, scenes from bad movies, and there are different themes. And uh, Cheech and Chong get high in a movie theater, and they've got the trash can full of popcorn. And um, Gilda Radner does that little girl character. And uh, Dan Aykroyd does a great bit where he's a survivor of the nuclear apocalypse, but yeah. he's also a former radio DJ. I love that whole bit. And John Candy does a salute to Ed Wood, and he focused on Bride of the Monster. Um, Plan 9 from Outer Space, and it ends with Glenn or Glenda, a touching story of a man wrestling with his transvestism, and I loved it. And so I went looking for Ed Wood movies. I would get the TV guide, and I looked through every movie in the back. And if I saw one, oh, hey, this is Bride of the Monster. It's playing at uh, 10 a.m. on Channel 83. And I would wake up and I would watch it. And, hey, they're going to play Planning from Outer Space at midnight. Uh, Mom, Dad, I never called him that. Terry, Pepe, can I stay up until midnight and watch Ed Wood's Planning from Outer Space? Stevie, you forget. We don't care about you. Do whatever you want. We're drunk. 
So I'm so they're just drinking and I'm staying up watching Plan 9 from Outer Space. And I became obsessed with Ed Wood. And I I I thought that his movies weren't that bad. And so when I was in college, so when I was in high school, I started wearing women's clothes and I kept doing it. And I was in college and I did it more. And my parents would get angry with me. And um, I remember my father uh, took me and my mom to the mall once. We're going to go to the mall. Then we're going to go to this store. Then we're going to go here. We're going to pick up this. And, but we went to the mall and my dad got angry and we went straight home. And I wasn't sure why. Why are you doing this? Uh, it turns out I was walking too gay. Oh. And my dad spent an hour yelling at me teaching me to walk straight like a man and not an f a other letter okay so, uh so there's that so I, I through ed wood and my obsession with ed wood uh that was the the first glimpse i had into uh being trans and i watched this movie and i spent my whole life freaking laughing at this movie but now i i even created my entire an entire religion about it the church of ed wood so now i'm trans and i must have watched this movie at least 50 times as a man but i've only seen it a handful of times as a woman and this film is such a different film for me now like as a, it, it i i guess you know movies change with you yeah yeah when I was a kid, I loved The Goonies. I cannot watch one second of that now. It's annoying as hell. What are these kids doing? They they should stay at home and listen to their parents getting into all these shenanigans. You know, like like I watch I watched The Little Mermaid growing up and it was a beautiful film about true love, but the older I get, it's like, bitch, you're like 15. Yeah. You are 15 years old. Listen to your freaking father. Yeah, I relate to Sebastian. I relate to the dad. Like, these people are poisoning your water. They're eating your friend. How are you wanting to be a part of that? Yeah. These people are horrible. These people are absolutely horrible. Like, um... As a teen, I watched Kevin Costner's Waterworld when it came out. Yeah. And it was yeah. a horrible movie, and I laughed at it. And it's still a horrible movie. Don't get me wrong. But now in my 40s, I can watch it and go, look at that set. They just got a giant floating set. And it looks incredible. How did they make it? That's insane. Uh, Dennis Hopper is chewing all the scenery, having fun as hell. A lot of the scenes are beautifully shot. How hard must it be to make a movie 98% on water? Yeah. In, in the middle of the ocean? I appreciate the film more now. And so I feel bad about all the times that I watch Glenn or Glenda laughing at it because now I'm watching it as a trans woman. The film opens with a trans woman committing suicide. Yeah. <sighs> Because she had just gone to jail and she was a trans woman who was jailed for dressing as a woman. Hey, that's some serious stuff, you know? Yeah. That's serious. You know, over 50% of trans and non-binary youth aged 13 to 24 have considered suicide? That's effed up. That is messed up. Uh, end of 2021, beginning of 2022, I was con considering committing suicide. So I, 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 now I watch this movie, that ending gave me the freaking chills. That is serious. You know? You know what else is serious? My mom! That's a reference to a cartoon. I don't think you've seen Bunny. Okay. I don't want you to be confused. That's a reference to um, the Cartoon Network show, Regular Show. 
Thank you. Shane P. Granger says Waterworld was a $40 million flop. Good film. Arson Cuff says Tentacle, Octopus, Tentacle, Tentacle, Dorito. That got my wife's attention. What about Tentacles? Right there. Boom. They know what it's about. Yeah, they know what it's about. So, uh... Uh, so yeah, I love this movie. It blows me away. I have a little bit more to say, but we've got a, like a three minutes left. Okay. But I don't have that much to say. Should we just run it through again? Yes. How about we take a short break? Wait, we're not and when done. we come back, I'll finish what I have to say. And then we can talk about next week and wrap it up. Okay. Because there's no way that I can do that in the two and a half minutes that I have right now before uh, Zoom resets. So how about we take a short break, really short break, really tiny short break. Those of you who are still watching, please stick around. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back. Okay. When we come back, we're going to uh, finish our talk on Glenn or Glenda. Does that sound good? Sound good. Let's go. All right, we will be right back. I'm scared. Are you scared? I'm, I'm really, really scared. You're scared. This is my impression of Jigsaw if he was an eight-year-old child. Hello, Mom and Dad. I'd like to play a game. Do you, do you have any games on your phone that I could play, please? I like the Kitos. That wasn't too. Oh, that looks great. Hold on, let me let me just let me just uh. Okay, let me know when we're back. We're back in. Okay. What you, I just thought it it had kind of a David Cronenberg body horror type of thing if you don't know that it's chicken marinating. So I thought that by like opening with that, like look at that there on the the Twitch stream. I thought that looked creepy as hell. But yes, well, we are was, back. That was all of Herschel Gordon Lewis though. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Herschel Gordon Lewis. Godfather of Gore. The South gonna rise again. Yeah. I like that movie. I like uh, uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis's Bloody Brigadoon. Yeah. I, I love that. I like that more than I like uh, uh, Blood Feast. Uh, but. I don't know. It's hard to say. Bunny. Bunny. Um. I figured out what we're doing this summer. Okay. And it's going to be fun. And it's not going to be the Fast and the Furious movies. Because F those movies. I don't want to do it. Every summer, we do a, a themed summer where we focus on a specific type of thing. We've done the summer of Star Wars. The summer of Saw movies. The summer of Bottoming. Where uh, we just did anal. For the entire... Oh, my wife is shaking it. Wow. Yowza. Um, we watched movies from IMDb's bottom 100 list of the 100 worst movies of all time. Uh, so uh, this summer, I'm going to tell you, I know what we're doing this summer. I will tell you at the end of the podcast. Okay. So uh, get ready for that. So, um... I 100% agree with what this movie has to say about hats. Okay. I 100% believe that. Bunny, were you a big sports fan growing up? Never. 
Neither was I. You know what we both have? A beautiful head of hair, my friend. Okay. Uh, I was that's wondering. What we, that's what we both have. We both have a beautiful head of hair. And the reason why you and I have a beautiful head of hair is because we don't like sports. Because men, they love sports. Oh, I'm going to wear this uh, jacket of my sports team and this shirt of my sports team and this tight-ass hat of my sports team. I'm going to wear this tight hat, which restricts the blood flow to my head everywhere I go. And then these people are so confused as to why they're balding in their 30s. It's because you are wearing that hat all of the time. The same thing happened in the 1950s. Edward talks about it at Glenda Glenda. I 100% agree with that. Back in, back in Ed Wood's day, everyone just wore like a hat when they went outside. Every guy wore yeah. a hat. You had to wear a fedora and look like uh, you were in Guys and Dolls. Nicely, nicely, Johnson. Sit down, you're rocking the boat. Uh, porcupine racetrack. But now it's like sports teams, primarily. If I was a kid and they made hats based on uh, bad movies, then I would be bald right now. Yes. But they didn't. And so there you go. So I 100% believe that. That is an absolute fact. Now, the way I see it, this <laughs> film, Glenn or Glenda, this film, Glenn or Glenda, these films, these these films, Glenn or Glenda, the, people, they're laughed at. Oh, Ed Wood, the worst director of all time. Glenn, I'm from outer space, the worst movie of all time. Do you know it, it? It's like, oh, Ed Wood is the worst director of all time. If Plan Nine from Outer Space is the worst movie of all time, obviously you've never downloaded Tubi. Yes. Jeez Louise! So many horrible movies have been made that it has been about a decade since an Ed Wood movie. It's been over a decade. It's been maybe two or three decades. Since uh, any Ed Wood movie was on the IMDb bottom 100. Because so many yeah. bad movies are being made and just being thrown on a streaming service or direct to Redbox. I don't know. They were swept away. Number 100 on the IMDb bottom 100 list that summer was Mad. Donna in Guy Ritchie swept away. And I gotta say, worse than every other movie we saw. That was bad. I remember not hating Slenderman that much. I remember hating Chun Li so much that it was kind of funny. But swept away with Madonna, absolute worst. I will never watch that again. I'll watch Battlefield Earth a couple more times, but I will not put on Swept Away. Yucca Part 6. Ugh, that was the worst. But people laugh at Glenn or Glenda. However, uh, it, but what is this movie about? When I asked you to explain the quote, to, to ex explain the plot of Glenn or Glenda, you had a hard time. You well, because sure. there are different I'm ways. Because, because I don't know if even Ed wanted to admit the movie that he was making here. Yeah. So if we take it very on the surface, this is a cross-dressing man in a relation to relationship to a woman. But a lot of everything else that he is talking about throughout the rest of the movie is clearly trans. Yes. Like, it was a step that maybe he felt he was not able to make in his life. Yeah. yeah so, I will, Ed... so, therefore, I will only take it from this point to this point and stop there. This movie is, Ed Wood, quote, this movie is Ed Wood's attempt at, quote, taking the curse off of being trans. 
because at, in yeah. his day and age, you could get arrested for going to the movies as a woman. And that was something that happened to him. That yeah. it was a crime for to be trans. So Ed Wood was trying to normalize being trans in 1953. That's freaking impressive. And I love this movie so much, and it means so much more to me now. I I, I love the scene that's like playing right now with the like pipe fitters, the the welding, the average Joes. But now, and, still, uh, okay, still, you got to admit that as a movie, still not a good movie. Yes. It might have it might have good things to say, but literally, this movie could be a radio play. This movie is like having kids, and your kids say, "Mom, Dad." I wrote a play. Do you want to watch it? And you sit down and you watch this play that your kids made. And it's not a good play, but it came from your kids' heart. Yeah. And you can tell that what they are doing is super important to them and they love it. So you sit there and you watch it and afterwards you give them claps and you say, good show. But this is Ed's personal, beautiful bizarre nonlinear artistic statement is it good it's not great but you can tell that this meant so much to him oh, and i love yeah. that fuck yeah i love that so much oh no it's definitely to be admired yeah i'm, I'm not saying that but but i did have good, not the best filmmaker in the world yeah, most of the movie comprises. Uh, I mean, what we're seeing right now is some of the more artsy attempts, but most of it is two people in a room talking. Yeah, a lot of that. You know, and oh, except for the big car chase at the end, that blew me away. Where did he get the trans mentor? Yeah, yeah, the old trans trans people just find each other. Yeah, that's all I can say. There were people at I, I go to church now. I've been going to church for a year now. I am uh, active in my local Episcopalian church, and uh, slowly but surely, all of these uh, old white Episcopalians have been liking me on Facebook, and I've been nervous about that because so many of these Episcopalians are old and rich and white, and I don't know if my extreme leftist, uh, extremely trans ideology mesh, meshes with their lifestyle. But yeah. um, there were people at church who didn't realize I was trans. And there were people at church that I didn't realize were trans. Oh, I'm one of like five trans people at that church. And that is awesome. And then I'm finding all of these trans friends on, on a, on Twitter and I'm on all these groups on Facebook and I have a trans son and um, I try not to say that because I don't want to be Royal Tannenbaum. What? This is my youngest, Eleanor. This is Maxwell. And this is my trans son, Mal. I don't want to just say that over and over again. Yeah. This is my trans son. I, I don't want to just label them as just that. Because there are a lot of other things. They're also uh, extremely loud and wonderful at cussing. They have become like a cuss smear. That is, that is good. That is good. There was always that potential there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But I have a problem with Glenn and Glenda. There are things that are inexcusable in this film that I have a hard time with. Okay. This film, yes, it's trying to 
You can say Ed Wood made a film in the 1950s trying to normalize trans people. And, and you can say that, but that's only part of it. This film is still very much a product of its time because at the end, oh, yeah. Glenn is cured of being trans. Yeah, it seems as if this film is trying to say if you like wearing women's clothes, there's one of two things. Number one, you cure yourself of this horrible thing, or number two, you get your dick chopped off. There is no in between. <laughs> no, it's the 1950s. Get your dick chopped off, or give it up. So, you know, uh. Glenn is cured of being trans in the first story, while in the much shorter second story, it's basically stated or implied that if you're a man who wants to be a woman, the only way is surgery. It's either surgery or you get cured. Yeah. So this movie is about acceptance, and yet you can tell that society made Ed really hate himself for wanting to dress as a woman. Yeah. And I feel bad for him. But trans is different now. Being trans is different now. Ed paints Glenda as basically having split personalities. I'm trans. I don't have a split personality. I used to be Steve. Now I'm May Lynn. Period. I, I'm, not, I'm not like, oh, I'm torn. You know, like Ed in the yeah. whoa, like that, like that scene where he takes off his wig in front of the mirror. Yes, like, like that's not me. But I do understand what trans people say. That, like in the beginning, when I came out, I said, "I'm, I'm a woman. I am trans. My name is Maylin. I am Maylin now, but I'm still the same person that you knew." I'm still the person that you knew and grew up with and worked with. I'm still that same person. I'm still Mr. Steve, the storyteller, and I'm still Steve. I'm just May Lynn now. But it's a, I've been trans for almost two years, and I've been transitioning a, on hormone replacement therapy for almost two months now. For uh, two months. Uh, for almost a year. I've been trans for almost two years, and I've been on hormones for almost one year. I feel like I am 100% a different person. I am literally, there is no more Steve in me. I am 100% May Lynn. I remember that person, but I am not that person. People can change. I think I'm ready to hold the baby. <laughs> Ask Bunny. He used to be in my Dangerous Nights crew. What crew? We went out for wings once. You take me to you took me to a place called the Blue Dolphin. Blue Dolphin's not there anymore. It burned down. Johnny Ronnie's ass up. He works with his brother now. <laughs> oh, God, I love I love that show so much. I speak a new language and it's called I Think You Should Leave. It's on Netflix. It's the greatest show in the world. I'm quoting that like I used to quote Monty Python. Yeah. Me me. Now, instead of me, me, or nudge, nudge, wink, wink, I say, oh, nice. That is a good idea. And I stand by. The best part of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania is when the guy from the focus group sketch in season one of I Think You Should Leave shows up. That's worth the ticket alone. <laughs> that is worth the ticket alone. Thank you, Spider-Man. Good on you, dude. And then the guy who played Santa Claus in two skits in season two of I Think You Should Leave was the uh, redneck guy in the, uh, in the laundromat in the best picture of the year. I... Everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, so anyway, Glenda Glenda. Uh, wonderful movie, but being trans is different. Um, 
I don't have split personalities, and Glenn didn't have split personalities. Ed didn't have split personalities. This is how I see being trans now. Um, when I mistakenly thought I was a guy, I was drinking all the time, and my girlfriend, whom I was living with, Debbie, she was smoking weed all the time. And after work, we would go to Bennigan's, and we knew all the bartenders, and we would drink with them. And then we would close the bar down, but they would still let us in there, and we'd drink some more. And then it's like 2 a.m., and we head to the bartender's house. Like, the three of them lived together, and they smoked a bunch of weed and listened to Grateful Dead, and we stayed up until about 4 or 5 in the morning, drunk and high. And I, that's when I started listening to the Grateful Dead. I heard the song St. Stephen at about the time that the Church of Ed Wood started exploding. And next thing you know, I'm doing interviews on NPR, and I'm on... Oh, this talk show wants to talk to me. This morning radio station wants to schedule an interview. This syndicated show wants to do a bit with me. Oh, I'm going to be interviewed for this magazine, this newspaper. And it was all exciting. And so I, I would listen to the song St. Stephen with a rose in and out of the garden he goes. Country garden with the wind and the rain. Wherever he goes, the people all complain. Um... Did it matter? Does it now? Stephen would answer if he only knew how. I thought that that song was about me. And it was my theme. And I was saying, Stephen. And then I stopped listening to the song. And then I realized I was trans. And about a year ago, I heard the song for the first time in a long time. And just like watching Glenn or Glenda as a trans woman, now I see St. Stephen as a song about Malin and St. Steve, because even before uh, I was May Lynn, I was Steve, and basically Steve died so that May Lynn could live. So now the song Saint Stephen is about uh, the martyr Steve who gave up his life so that May Lynn could be an awesome bitch. Okay. And so, and so I, when I would listen to it as a guy, I never understood the part where everything starts getting really slow. And the first line is lady fingers dipped in moonlight. Writing what for across the morning sky. And it gets all, all sad and all quiet yeah. and all, I don't know, sexy, if you can call Grateful Dead sexy. The combined weight of that band was like 900 yeah, um, pounds. Yeah, I'm not going to accept that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but now, the song St. Stephen is about the person who I used to be, but then when the lady fingers dipped in moonlight part, that part's about May Lynn. Now the song's about the both of us. It's about how Steve died so then May Lynn could live. And I am super happy and I love my life. And there are all these freaking Republicans out there that are just painting all uh, trans people as uh, pedophiles and deviants. It, it, we're getting our rights taken away. I live in the absolute worst state right now. Uh, I, I'm wanting to get some facial feminization surgery, get some electrolysis for my uh, five o'clock shadow that won't stop. Yeah, but it, so I'm I'm trying to get some surgery scheduled for myself, and I'm really happy with how far I have come in my trans journey. But so, like um, actual plastic surgery? Yeah, uh, my my insurance does cover up to an extent um, gender affirming surgeries, including facial feminization surgery. So. Uh, Tightening out my cheeks a little bit, making the nose smaller, making the chin less chiseled and beautiful, fixing yeah. hairlines, and just making my face smaller and more feminine. And uh, shaving down this uh, big honking Adam's apple that I have. I'd have yeah. less of a massive forehead, and I'd just look more feminine and more passing, and I'm hoping to get that. It, maybe in a year or two. Yeah, but there's but there's got to be like some YouTube tutorials and things like that. I, 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 I think I think Tasha should do it on her Twitch channel. Bunny, we might knock on your door tonight. We're shaving with... down Maylin's Adam's apple. 
Yeah, we're and gonna she, knock and, on your door, and with she's got a bucks. cheese grater. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it can't be as painful as the face waxing I did. And that, that, oh, you should, I sh you should have put me, you should have put me down for that. You should have uh, knocked me out, given me some whiskey or something. That was horrible. But, um, society has changed in the now 70 years since this movie came out. This is the 70th anniversary of Glenn or Glenda. Yeah. It came out in 1953, and here we are in 2023. This film that people are still talking about and taking new and interesting looks at is almost 100 years old. Yeah. And it still has a lot to say, but it's obvious that in Eddie's day, you couldn't just come out and be a woman. But now you can. Sure your life will be in danger and you might have rights taken away and a kid's book author will want you dead. Yeah. A kid's book author who wrote some books that sound an awfully lot like a bunch of other books. This chick will just want you to die. Um, uh, but... Excuse me. She's the victim here? Yeah. J.K. Rowling is the victim. J.K. Rowling is uh, the only billionaire who actually has it rough. Or oh, oh, just weak. I don't know. I see, I see a lot of transphobes and things like that. Y your top 100 transphobes. You know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. Like your Matt Walsh's and things like this. And like, how weak are you? What yeah. I, I don't understand, I don't understand. Like, I see a man with a problem when I hear them talking about trans transgender people. I see a man with. I I am a cishet male. That's what I am. I didn't choose this. This is what I am. This is all. You putting on a dress and coming out as trans has done nothing to me. I think apparently I'm supposed to put on a dress now. Like Won't that's how it works. Somebody please think of the children. So when I yeah. hear them going on, like I'm just hearing their own fragile, weak sense of self. Yeah, and it's like really, like just work on yourself, dude. How weak, how weak can a billionaire author be that the existence of a 46-year-old trans woman is a danger to her? Yeah. Yeah. But being trans is doable now. And it, it, it was a lot harder in Edward's day. And Glenn or Glenda is an attempt by Edward to normalize that, uh, that, trans lifestyle in the hopes that, you know, one day people won't have to be cured. The Glens can just... I wish that I could go to Ed Wood and say, hey, you can just be Glenda. You don't have to be Glenn. I, we live in a yeah. society. Just be who you want to be. It doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah, I, I think I might have a similar criticism to this that I have to Wang Fu, where like, yes, he's really trying to say something, and he's be and, and he's being bold and brave as fucking shit, especially for the time. Okay, yeah, but you could tell that he is not ready to fully commit to it, and that shows. Patrick Swayze have... and Wesley Snipes we're not ready to commit to those parts, and I think it shows. John Leguizamo, on the other hand, Hachi She Mama. was Miss Chi Chi. You get John Leguizamo in Romeo plus Juliet. 
it's not Romeo and Juliet. There's a freaking plus. And then you get uh, John Leguizamo in Two Wong Fu. Thanks for everything, Julie Newmar. You put those together, you have me. <laughs> I had the hots for John Leguizamo's character in Two Wong Fu. Thanks for everything, Julie Newmar. That did something for me. <laughs> and again, I had no clue I was trans. I'm so blind. I mean, it did something for me. I'm not trans. Yeah, but it did something for me. Woo! I love John Leguizamo so much. But if Ed Wood existed now, he would just be Shirley. Which was his yes. female name, just like Glenn was Glenda. Ed Wood dressed as a woman and was Shirley, but he was always Ed Wood. But if Ed Wood were around today, he wouldn't be Ed Wood. We'd be talking about the movies of Shirley. Yes, we would. Shirley Wood. Shirley. Shirley Wood. What song is that? Shirley Wood. That's a, that's. Oh, that's going to bug me. It's, it's some classic rock song. Um, I think it's Led Zeppelin. Okay. Um, but Ed Wood would be trans if he were alive, and I think he would be proud of me. Yes, he would. Being a trans woman, spreading his word, going to the movies. The first movie I saw as a woman was Raya and the Last Dragon. I was so nervous going to the movies as a woman, and my, my wife. And my kids, they were so nice, and they were like, we know you're nervous, other mother. We can go with you. And I was like, no, I'm not sure why, but Maylin has never gone to, to a movie theater ever. This is something I have to do on my own. And I did, and I saw this movie, and it now, ah, oh, this Disney movie is an important piece of my heart. Because <laughs> it was the first movie I ever saw. And I have a couple of stuff in my background. Uh, ten minute warning again. Wow. Well, I'm 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 pretty much done. I think Edward would be proud of me and we, I love we this. We need movie. to canonize it as a Woody and Holiday though. We do. We do. We do. We absolutely do. Bonnie. Yes. Uh so next week we're gonna do Skin of Uh question. We record this every other Sunday. So the next time we would record would be Easter. Do you still want to do it on Easter if you have nothing going on? I would have no problem with that. I'm still a heathen. You're the church lady. Yeah, but I can still go to church. <laughs> church is earlier. Church is at 8. It's just another it Sunday to me. But are you okay with that, Bunny? Sure. Doing it on Easter? Sure. So next week for Easter to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, skin a -merig. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this movie is freaking. You either you are either scared to death of it, or it's the worst movie you've ever seen. I can yeah. see how people would be deathly scared of this, but also. I cannot stand this movie at all. First off, Bunny, before you watch it, it's in our cough cough, but I want to let you know. It's not a bad copy. It's not a bootleg. It's not a cam. That's just how the movie looks. That's just how it looks. Okay. Okay? Don't go, oh, there might be something wrong here. Or, oh, was someone in a trench coat, like, filming this at 3 a.m. at a movie theater in New York City? No, that's just how the movie looks. <laughs> this movie is in, like, fucking, is in 780p or whatever. What it, It's it, it's not high definition, but it's not, whore, it's not 480p. It's, like, 720-whatever p. Yeah. It just looks like that. So I want to <laughs> let you know now. I cannot wait for you to watch this movie so we can discuss it. And so, before we go, let me tell you what we're doing this summer. I am excited for this. I am super excited for this. 
I'm calling it the summer. I just unplugged the microphone. Hold on. Ah! Okay. Can you hear me, Bunny? I can hear you. Okay. I'm calling it the summer of yo. Uh-oh. Okay. We're watching every Rocky. Every Rocky? what? Oh. Rocky. Rocky. Rocky 2. Rocky 3. Rocky 4. And unfortunately, Rocky 5. Rocky Balboa. Creed. Creed 2. And by the time we get to that, Creed 3 should be out as a digital. So we'll watch that one too. We're also going to be watching some other boxing adjacent films, such as Boxing Helena. Okay. It is a boxing movie, so that'll be fun. Uh, and I've got a few other kind of Rocky knockoffs. Um, we should watch the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> like, this is a weird sequel. Yeah. Oh, I am. I have a great idea for a cover <laughs> album where you do covers of popular songs as different celebrities i was just now picturing tim curry as dr frankenfurter it's the eye of the tiger <laughs> the thrill of the fight rising up to the challenge of our rivals <laughs> Gladiator, that was another one that I was thinking of doing for the summer of woe. But here's what's going to make this really fun, Bunny. Okay. We are going to count every yo. Uh-oh. Every yo in every movie, and then we'll be keeping a running tally of how many yo's are in the entire series. So by the time we get to Creed 3, how many yo's have been said? Okay. Now, Rocky V will really throw us off because there's one scene. So in Rocky V, Rocky loses all of his money and he goes back to live in the crabby neighborhood that he started. And uh, it's Christmas and Paulie's still alive, despite the fact that he smoked uh, 100 cigars every day for 60 years. Uh, Paulie shows up and he's uh, dressed as Santa Claus and he goes, he has a sack over his back, and he goes, Yo, 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 I'm Santa Claus. And Rocky goes, Hey, Santa, you don't say yo, yo, yo. You say ho, 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 not yo, yo, yo. And <laughs> the the Polly is like, Well, I'm Santa, and if I say that I say yo, 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 then I say yo, yo, yo. And my friends and I specifically said, Let's count how many yo's are in this movie. And this scene is happening, and like, Four high schoolers are just laughing their asses off while everyone else is being silent and they're confused. <laughs> I say everyone else like a bunch of people went to go see Rocky Five, but I'm really excited about the summer of Yo. This is going to be fun. Like Some fun. of these movies are great. Some of the movies are great. <clears throat> Not all of the movies, uh... but some of them are wonderful. I love Mr. T. And I love all of Rocky IV. I love all of that movie. I liked Rocky III, but like that's it's it's not a good movie. Yeah, you yeah. know, especially when we start with Rocky, which is a good movie. Yeah, and a hard drama, and definitely an Oscar winner. Yeah. But that's what we're doing this summer. The, the summer of yo, be sure oh, to no, stick with us. Oh, no, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I'm excited. And also, I've just been postponing doing the summer of Fast and or Furious because I hate those movies. Uh, but that's it's the Cle summer. It's the Cleveland Balloon disaster of summer movies. Yes. Yes. Uh, the Cleveland Balloon disaster. Yeah, we'll get to it eventually. Um. Honey, we only we only got to the twentieth, the twenty first president. So we're gonna continue. It's gonna be a theory of making fun of presidents. It was it was so good. It was so much fun. Oh, it's okay. Um, but that's uh, in the future. Now that I'm thinking about this, this movie, 
I gotta say, I've gotta say, when I'm looking back at this episode of the Pope on Film, hold on. I think this is a damn good episode. This has been a damn good episode. We are in agreement, my friend. Yes. This time I was so certain that it was a good episode. That this is, I believe, the first episode ever that I that I've purposefully stepped on your toes. <laughs> because that's how good this episode has been. Yes. But yes, I concur with <laughs> your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. <laughs> And I am Reverend May Lynn, and on behalf of Eleanor and Natasha and Mal and Maxwell and everybody else, I just want to say thanks for listening, and we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you do sparkles and cookie tips. And you blends or blenders? Nice. Little, little, look. <laughs> Good job, Eleanor. Good job. Tonight, Johnny welcomes Dr. Joyce Brothers, <laughs> Dom Deloise, and music from David Bowie. And now, here's Johnny. A hole in the wall where the men can see it all. Do 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 do